At Columbia Biblical Seminary, our PhD program can be completed fully online with concentrations in Biblical Studies, Theological Studies, and Practical Theology. Full-time students can finish this program within three years, and our PhD program is competitively priced with other major programs in the United States and Europe. Columbia Biblical Seminary, solidly evangelical, great commission focused. Hi, I'm Dr. David Croto, and this week we're going to talk about interpreting the Gospels. It's going to be a two-part series on interpreting the Gospels. Now first, I want to give you a quick reminder about genre. Last week, I mentioned the, the concept of genre, that is, types of literature, and that different types of literature require different rules for interpretation. For example, you read a phone book different than you read a text message, different than you would read a menu at a restaurant. And each of those types of literatures have different rules for interpretation. And so we're going to talk about the genre of Gospels and some basic principles to keep in mind when you're interpreting the Gospels. Now there are four Gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels, meaning we see them together. That's what that word synoptic means, the idea of seeing together because they're very similar. They tell a lot of the same stories. They have a lot of the same themes in them. John is a little different. John, written probably a few decades after Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and comes at it from a different perspective, and there's not a lot of overlap between John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There is some, but not a lot. Now, the Gospels need to be interpreted different than letters and poetry because there are different rules for interpreting Gospels. So when we get into interpreting New Testament letters, when we get into talking about the poetic literature of the Old Testament, you're going to see that we're going to talk about different concepts because it's a different genre. Essentially, the Gospels are biographies of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. You know, it's, it's a unique genre. We don't see Gospels written out before we, we actually read the New Testament historically. In fact, since I think that Mark was probably the first Gospel written, in a sense, Mark kind of invented the genre of gospel, but not in a vacuum because these biographies are similar to biographies written in the ancient world. And so when we read those biographies and see how they're written and we see how the gospels are written, we can see enough similarities to construct some, some rules for how to interpret the gospels. One thing that's important to recognize about the Gospels in the New Testament is while they are ancient biographies, they are not modern biographies. And there's differences between how people wrote biographies 2,000 years ago and people, how people write biographies today. For example, in ancient biographies, there are not many details about the person's life. There's some details, but not a lot of details about the entire life of the person. In fact, in ancient biographies, sometimes many sections of the person's life will just be skipped over. One section, though, might be focused on. So let's, let's take a look at what this would look like in a modern biography. So let's say someone was writing a modern biography on the life of former President Barack Obama. So they start off and they talk about his birth, where he was born and what his childhood was like and the different places he lived and the places he visited. And then it would talk about him, his, 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 his teenage years and then getting accepted to university and then going to the university and studying there and then going to Harvard and going to grad school. They would talk about him meeting his wife, his future wife, Michelle, and then finishing up his law degree, and then they would talk about his early years of, of, of service, and then they would talk about his rise to being the senator, and then his surprising victory as a young senator to the presidency of the United States and what that election was like, and then they would talk about him running for re-election and what that was like, and they would tell details of every section of his life. But imagine you were reading a biography of Barack Obama, and it never said anything about his birth or his childhood. It never actually said anything about him meeting his wife. 
It just started with his first run for presidency. And Michelle's in the story, his children are in the story, but they just kind of get picked up in the story. You never actually read about where they came from. In an ancient biography, that would be normal. By today's standards, if someone said, I'm writing a biography of Barack Obama, and it started with his presidency, that would be considered a poor biography. But in ancient standards, that was normal. And so we have to have a little shift of our expectations in biographies. Now, let's apply this to the Gospels in the life of Jesus. We see in the life of Jesus, when we read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that there are sections entirely skipped. Like, what do we know about Jesus' childhood? Well, we hear about his birth, specifically in Luke, but not in John. In fact, in John, after he introduces uh, Jesus uh, in, in general terms, theological terms, in the first 18 verses, the first story we get about Jesus, he's an adult male, and he's calling his disciples. That's the first story we get, over 30 years after his birth. And so a whole section has been skipped there. But let's, let's zoom in on the Gospel of John and, and watch the flow of the narrative of this Gospel. So in John 1 to, John, to, to the end of John 11, in those 11 chapters, that covers over three years of Jesus' earthly ministry. Over three years and 11 chapters. Chapter 12 through chapter 21, those final 10 chapters cover one week about one week of Jesus' life. So, 11 chapters for three years, 10 chapters for one week. That's very intentional. This is not a sloppy author like it would be considered today. This is a very intentional way of telling the story because the author is trying to say the most important thing about the life of Jesus Christ is that last week and what he accomplished there. And so, we have to look at the narrative flow and realize when an author slows down the progress of time and covers one week, essentially, in about 10 chapters, he's trying to say something there. And that's some of the differences between ancient biographies and modern biographies. One more difference is that ancient biographies weren't necessarily chronological. That doesn't mean there wasn't aspects that were chronological, but it doesn't mean they couldn't be chronological, but that wasn't necessarily their goal. Even Luke, who said he was writing an orderly account in Luke 1.3, wasn't necessarily writing chronologically. I'm not saying he never did, but that wasn't necessarily his goal because that wasn't necessarily the goal of ancient authors. And the word orderly in Luke 1.3 could refer to chronological order or geographical order or logical order. So we just want to be careful that we don't impose modern standards of biography onto ancient documents. And that's the idea of this being a foreign genre to us. And we have to understand how those types of writings were written. Now we can get into some keys to interpreting the Gospels. First of all, you want to ask the right questions. There's lots of questions we can ask with every passage. And the more questions you ask, the better. We talked about that with observation, interpretation, and application. And so we want to ask questions. But not all questions are the right questions to ask, or even the best questions to ask. So there are two primary questions that you should ask when you're reading the Gospels. Number one, what does the story communicate about Jesus? And what is the main point of the passage, the, the whole passage? Not a specific phrase, not a specific verse, but when there's a story, a contained story about Jesus, why did the author include that story? What's the main point? Now, you might think that that's kind of a, those are kind of obvious questions. What did it say about Jesus and what's the main point? But there are many times where we actually get distracted when we're reading the Gospels with an issue or a topic that wasn't really what the author was talking about. For example, in John chapter 2, Jesus turns water into wine. Now, when I teach through the Gospel of John in, in the university, many times we get to there, that passage, and I will say to the students, look, this passage is, does not answer the question of whether or not Christians are allowed to drink alcohol. That's not the point of the passage. In fact, you can ask the question, just don't answer it, because this passage is virtually irrelevant 
to that question. That's not what the author was trying to say. And inevitably, students will still say, but don't you think it's important to realize that, da, 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 and they'll, they'll try to make a, a point about John 2 and whether Christians can drink alcohol. And what happens is we get distracted. John is trying to say something about Jesus, not about whether we can, we can or can't drink alcohol. He's trying to communicate something about Jesus. When we get distracted by these other details, we miss the point that John is trying to make. So we need to stay focused on what John is saying about Jesus, what the main point of the passage is, not the questions we have, but the things he's trying to communicate. Now, many, time, many times it's really neat because the main point of the passage really is uh, to communicate something about Jesus. And so those two questions really kind of come together at that point to, to really communicate the, the same thing. Another concept to, to take into consideration when interpreting the gospel, Gospels are the two contexts, the two contexts for the gospel. Realize that when we're reading these stories in the Gospels, these are events that took place in history. There was an, a literal historical setting for the story. So when Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, that took place. He was giving that sermon. There, was, there were people there. There was an audience there, and he was addressing an audience. Secondly, it's the context of the church. When the gospel writers wrote down these stories, when they wrote them down, they were writing them down for an audience, and the audience was contemporary to their writing, typically the church. So you have the historical setting where the event took place, but then you have the, the setting of the writing of the documents when it was intended for a specific audience. So when Matthew wrote down the Sermon on the Mount, he wrote it down for Christians somewhere around the year 60, and he was trying to say that this is something you, you should know. This is something that's important for you. That's why he included it in the document. So the key to that, these understanding these two contexts, specifically the first one, the historical context where Jesus actually said these words, had these conversations, did these actions, is who is the original audience of Jesus' words? Because they don't exist anymore. When, when you read that Jesus is speaking to his disciples or to the scribes and Pharisees or to, to the crowds, realize that none of those people literally are around today. The 12 disciples, they're not here. The Pharisees are not here. There may be people who are Pharisaical, but the actual group, the Pharisees, is not, they're not here. The crowds, those historical crowds are not here anymore. So he was speaking to a specific people, but those people aren't here. Now, I'm not saying the words don't apply. I'm just saying we have to consider that. Remember the, the concept of the river of differences. He's speaking to the Pharisees. Well, that creates a little river of differences because we're not Pharisees. An, an example of understanding the, the, the context that Jesus actually said or did certain things, an example of that would be John 13 and the foot washing. In that cultural context, an inferior person always washed the feet of the superior person. And what Jesus was doing here is he is taking this cultural norm and turning it upside down because he's the superior and he's washing inferior feet. Now, that would have been shocking to them. And if you read Peter's reaction, you see it was shocking to them. But Jesus, Jesus does that a lot where he'll take a cultural norm and turn it upside down. So we need to remember that, that our culture is not necessarily their culture. It wasn't the culture that Jesus was in. So that's an example of understanding the historical context and how we understand the actual context that the events took place in history in the Gospels. That helps us to understand we need to be careful in interpretation. Another key principle is the literary context. Now, I know I talked about literary context already last week, but I can't emphasize literary context enough. The immediate context of the passage trumps all other factors in interpretation. Let me give you a little warning here, because I've seen this happen many times in, in churches and in pastors and preaching sermons. Many, sometimes a pastor will pull out some 
interesting piece of historical background information. You might read it in a book, you might hear it in a sermon, you might see it on the internet, and it sounds fascinating. But he doesn't necessarily give you a source, right? He's not telling you where he found it or how he knows it's true. He just gives you some interesting background information. Now, it may be true. It may not be true. But many times it's going to be used to kind of go against what the contextual interpretation of the passage is, meaning what the passage seems to mean in its literary context gets flipped because of this piece of speculative background information. Don't allow that to happen unless you can verify that background information. You know, if, if you're hearing a, someone on the internet, maybe you, you, you text them and say, and I've done this before, where I've emailed someone and said, where did you get that piece of background information? You know, when, when did that take place? And in the one event I'm, I'm thinking of specifically, the person who sent me the information back, very kind, I asked him very gently, he sent it back, and it was a couple hundred years after the New Testament, which actually made it irrelevant for his interpretation. Sometimes you might go up to your pastor and say, really, that was a fascinating piece of background information. Where'd you get that from? When, when did that take place? Or how do you know that was relevant for the, for the Gospels or something like that? So never allow background information to go against the literary context of the passage. And also, we want to be careful not to over-compare the Gospels. We want to let each Gospel and passage stand on its own and speak for itself. For example, with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because there are so many stories that are the same or very similar, we're going to have the, the tendency to want to compare them to each other, and that's good. I didn't say never compare. I said be careful about over-comparing. So we should compare. So we read a story in Matthew, we read the same story in Luke, and we see that Luke maybe emphasizes prayer in the passage, or the Holy Spirit in the passage, or women, or social outcasts in the passage. And that's good to note. But if our, our message, our, our, our Sunday school lesson, our sermon is on Matthew, you know, we don't want to then say Matthew is neglecting women, or social outcasts, or prayer. We want to let Matthew speak for Matthew. I've heard sermons before where there'll be a, the same story being Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the pastor will read the story in Matthew, and he'll get one point from Matthew. Then he'll go to Mark and get the second point from Mark, then go to Luke and get the third point from Luke. Well, they're different contexts, and the author can take the same story and try to emphasize and do something different with it. And it's not misusing it because there's lots of things you can learn from historical stories. And authors could be doing different things. We want to let Matthew be La Matthew, Mark be Mark, and Luke be Luke. That doesn't mean we don't compare. We just want to be careful not to over-compare. The next concept is the idea of connecting the stories together. A lot of times what I see when people are doing Bible studies through the Gospels is they'll, they'll do a passage, a passage, a certain passage in a Gospel, and then the next week they'll do another passage, and the next week they'll do another passage. And that's just common. Right? We, we have the headings in our Bible, and when that heading, when there's another heading, we go, okay, that's, that's a passage, and we'll study that. And that's good. But many times the authors are including the stories they include in the order they can include them to connect them together because the concepts between them are building a theme that they want you to, to, to grasp. So yeah, interpret each passage on its own, but then go back and look. What was the main point of this passage? What was the main point of the second passage? Do they connect? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But if they do, you might be picking up on a theme that the author is trying to communicate with the two passages. And I want to do this right now by looking at John chapter 2. So I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture to you, but I want to read the scripture to you so I can explain to you what's happening in the first story in John 2 and then the second story in John 2. So in John 2, 1 through 11, we read this. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, 
fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim and took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drank freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now, there are lots of details going on in that story, and I'm not going to go through and exhaustively exegete all of them. I'm just going to kind of touch upon a few points. Realize that there's a, a little side comment in this passage that's really important, and it's about the six stone water pots that were used for ritual purification. Now, the background for that is the Old Testament, where in the Old Testament, when someone became ceremonially or ritually unclean, they would wash themselves, and then eventually they would be clean again, ritually and ceremonially clean. So, Jesus uses these water pots to turn the water into wine, and that's important to consider. So, then we go down in the passage, and we see that that the, the, the head waiter and, and, and the bridegroom, they're tasting this wine and they're realizing that this wine is the best. It's better than the, the earlier wine. So what Jesus created was better than what was previously being served. So now what Jesus does is better. So what's this passage about? Well, it's not about whether or not Christians should or shouldn't drink alcohol. Generally, and this is a general interpretation, I'm going to suggest maybe a more specific way to understand it, but generally, Jesus was offering something better than Judaism had to offer. Now, if you want to get more specific, what I think it could be is that the cleansing that Judaism had to offer through ritual purification was temporary, because the next time that they did something that was sinful, they had to cleanse again. But Jesus' cleansing is permanent. We'll stick with the first one from now and just say this. What Jesus had to offer was better than what Judaism had to offer. So that's the first half of John chapter 2. Now let's take a look at the second part of the story. After this, this is starting in John 2, 12 to 23. After this, he went down to Capernaum and he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge out of cords and drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing the signs which he was doing. Now, there could be a temptation here, to go back to an earlier principle we talked about today, there could be a temptation here to overcompare this passage with the other Gospels that talk about Jesus going to the temple and turning over the money changer tables. The problem is, is that I think Jesus did this twice. He did it once at the beginning of his ministry and then once at the end. And the stories are actually different. 
because the reason, one of the reasons at least, that Jesus was doing that in, in the other Gospels, not the Gospel of John, was because the money changers were being dishonest. But there's nothing about dishonesty in John 2. And I've heard sermons where they'll talk about these dishonest money changers in John 2. But that's not the problem that Jesus has. Really, notice the, the focus on you're making my father's house into a business. See, where these money changers were set up was in, in the temple in Israel, they were set up in the court of the Gentiles. Because the this really made it convenient for Jews who were going to the temple to make sacrifices that they didn't have to bring animals from their home or buy animals from outside of Jerusalem or outside the gates of the temple. They could go into the temple, buy the animal, and bring it and have it sacrificed. Really convenient. Good business model. The problem is the court of the Gentiles was the one place on the planet where Gentiles could come to worship Yahweh. And now it was filled with animals and a business. And that's really the setting for why Jesus gets upset. So we don't want to overcompare the Gospels. Now, if you remember, my interpretation in John 2, 1 through 11 was that Jesus was offering something better than Judaism has to offer. But then we look at John 2, 12 to 23, and it's about this. Jesus is offering himself as the new center of worship, as the new temple. Realize, he says, this is the temple of my body. He was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was talking about it being destroyed and he'd raise it up in three days, he's talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And he's replacing the temple that they were worshiping, which, which was about to be, just in a historical context, it was going to be destroyed about four decades later. And he's saying, this is your new center of worship. So we see that this concept of of Jesus having something superior to offer. In the first half, maybe the cleansing, the idea of a permanent cleansing, but a better offer than Judaism has. In the second passage, he's offering himself as the new center of worship. Now, we could go through and we could keep walking through these passages and see if there are more themes. And that's one of the things you want to do when you're interpreting the Gospels, is connect these stories together. So when we connect these two, Jesus is offering something better than Judaism has to offer. Now, we are going to pause here for the day and pick up from here later this week when we'll continue discussing principles for interpreting the Gospels. Columbia Biblical Seminary offers 18-month online degrees designed to equip you to be effective in ministry. The Master of Arts in Bible Exposition will prepare you to communicate truths from God's Word effectively. The Master of Arts in Chaplaincy will prepare you for sports, corporate, and police chaplaincy. The Master of Arts in Ministry Studies will equip you for local and parachurch ministry, and the Master of Arts in Youth Ministry Leadership will train you to be a leader in ministries directed at youth. Columbia Biblical Seminary, solidly evangelical, great commission focused.